Um, part of this question of how things hang together is looking at the difference between the dissertation you sort of hope you might possibly write, I think of that as the aspirational dissertation, and the um, hang my head, I'm so embarrassed about this dissertation. So none of you are gonna write a hang my head, I'm so ashamed of this dissertation, dissertation. The, the place that you're working toward is finding a dissertation that is the good enough dissertation. So this is like um, Donald Winnicott, the psychologist who said, most parents are not actually gonna be everything that we wish parents could be, but they just need to be good enough parents to let their children go forward with a minimal sense of self and capacity to be in the world. So the dissertation that you're aiming for is a dissertation that is good enough that your supervisor and committee sign off on it, that you still feel like it's something you're interested in, minimally, mm -hmm. and that external examiners are gonna pass. So the dissertation is a credentialing moment. It's a thing to get through. It's also all these other things. But this is the moment to be like, what I'm trying to do is finish this degree. And everything else that happens in relation to it is just gravy. So this is that piece where you really have a sense of like, the dissertation is something I'm doing, but it's not everything that I am. And the last year of the dissertation work is really a time to focus on that. So it's not a bad idea, and again, we're not gonna actually do it right now, but just to write down what your hopes for the dissertation are. How would you know that you're meeting those hopes, right? So if you want your dissertation to be a groundbreaking transformation in you know, how people experience care, right? What, what would tell you that that was actually happening? How would you know it? Many of the things that come to us in terms of aspirational um, things are at a time scale that's way beyond the dissertation itself. So if you actually want your dissertation to have an effect on a policy matter, on people's lives, um, it's not gonna happen before the dissertation's done. So you can just be like, okay, I don't actually want it to have those effects. I wanna write something that could be helpful for these conversations that I'm engaged in. So doing that shift from the aspirational dissertation to the actual dissertation or the good enough dissertation also helps you articulate in the introduction and the conclusion what you see yourself to have been doing. And that's a, an important and powerful way to be thinking about um, how to talk to the committee members and the externals. Okay, so the timeline, I don't think we really need to talk about this very much, um, but it does really, um, it really helps if you actually relate to this. So um, the reason this helps is like right now, FGPA has 41 PhD defenses that they're trying to schedule before um, the term really starts so that people don't pay for fall tuition. And every time they have a dissertation defense, they have to find a room, they have to get the externals on board. There's all this stuff that happens and it's um, super stressful. So the more you can do to not be one of the people that's like, we couldn't find a chair for your dissertation on that date, um, or we couldn't find a room where there's only like three or four rooms on campus that have the capacity to um, beam people in, in a stable way and they get booked up, they get scheduled out, like you can't, you can't get them. So there's times where people end up paying another term of tuition because they couldn't schedule a room. So you wanna be the person whose the room's already scheduled and the only way to be that person is to finish the dissertation in time that the external says, yes, it's ready to go to, dis to defense because that's the point at which FGPA will schedule it. So recognize that writing is nonlinear and time is arbitrary, and so you might as well be early, which is a really super hard thing to do because the impulse is to be like, when's the latest I can possibly defend the dissertation? But the fact is everyone is doing that, and so everyone ends up getting um, packed in at the end. So a kindness to yourself is to be like, pretend that early deadlines are real and behave accordingly. What does that look like from a, a month's perspective? Okay, so, um, so this timeline is 
a, a timeline that will allow you to be one of the people who gets your room scheduled. So that means having the final defense copy to uploaded to Carleton Central six weeks before the defense. You actually have a month. Um, but if you do it a month before defense, you don't get your room scheduled necessarily. I mean, they try. They try really hard. Um, if you actually four months or three months before the defense date, talk to your supervisor about who to get as an external and an internal, you'll have a pretty good chance of actually getting those people. Because each person who gets asked to um, examine a thesis often is someone who's getting asked to examine multiple theses at many um, schools. So you want to be one of the people that they're like, I'm sorry, I can't do some other person's thesis. I've already committed. Um, so the, I think the key thing here is the three months before having a full draft that you submit to the committee, the whole committee, three months before. What that means is that your supervisor, you've had a conversation where you say, um, I would like to submit the full draft of the thesis to the committee. Are you comfortable signing off on it? So what that does rhetorically is say to the committee, the supervisor feels that this is ready to go and we're not making huge changes at this point. So you've gone through enough of a process with the supervisor that they're feeling pretty done and they're ready for the committee to see it. Committees vary. So sometimes committees have, like you have a committee member who's very active, um, but often you'll have not sent the whole thing to the committee. You'll send parts to them or you'll have particular conversations with the people who are expert in a particular area. So, um, so this sending the final version, you know, um, it, it usually takes, I'm a fast reader and it takes, it takes me about 12 hours to do a good reading of someone's full dissertation. Um, and like, and give reasonable comments. And most people will not do all 12 hours in one day. Um, most people don't need a full month to do it, but they have other theses coming, you know, and they, so it's also part of that, like, how long will they actually take to do it? So it's reasonable to expect a two week turnaround on chapters and you wanna build a pattern where you turn in a chapter and then you're not fretting about it, you're finishing drafting the next stage of another chapter or you're doing revisions on the chapter that you got comments back on. So um, in our department, many of you will have seen this, um, this email from Darlene, our admin person, um, which basically lays out, I can pass it around, um, the dates, right? So you'd be, if you're defending at the end of the winter term, you'd be submitting the intention to defend at the end of February. So it's like surprisingly early. Um, if you're gonna be doing, um, if you're gonna be submitting drafts to your committee and you think about that two week gap, how long do you need to do revisions once they give you feedback? So if you pass something in January 1st, and they optimistically get it back to you January 15th, how long does it take you to actually integrate their comments and think about it? So one thing to look at is, how long has it taken you to do things in the past? How long does it actually take you to write a chapter? Many people, it takes them three months to write a chapter. Many people think, I'm finishing my dissertation, so now I'll be able to write chapters in one month. Um, but there's not a real reason to think that. And therefore, there's also not a real reason to be mad at yourself if you can't write a chapter in a month. At the same time, it's nonlinear. And frequently, you come to a point where you've got a whole bunch of stuff there, and you just can be like, and it goes very fast. So really, the, um, I think the key points to start looking at are six months before you're planning to defend, you should feel like you have the substantive chapters pretty well done and your supervisor has seen them and feels good about where they're going. Um, and you should have a sense of what the table of contents is. So what you're actually planning to have in the dissertation. And then you can have a like, it would be nice to have this other stuff. Any questions about that timeline stuff? Can you send us a copy of what you just passed around? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, will you email me and then I'll write back Absolutely. with it? Yeah. Because yeah. I won't remember to just spontaneously mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. 
I can't wait to see what my uh, supervisor sent, asked me to send a uh, chat to her to get the information that I can see first to get the feedback and then, uh, you know, if my level uh, is sufficient to give it again. Yeah. Um, if you get feedback and then I'm going to submit the final. Yeah, that's coming. Yeah. That's coming? Yeah, so it varies by, by committee. So some committees, um, there'll be a, th a third reader who's like, I just want to see the final version. I'll talk to you about particular things if you need my expertise. Many committees will be, the supervisor reads the chapter and says, and this is, I think, a way I would recommend it if you don't have a pattern with your committee. A good pattern is you work with a supervisor on drafts, and you ask the supervisor explicitly, do you think this is ready to go to the committee members? And then either you or the supervisor send the draft that, is, that the supervisor is basically signed off on to go to committee members. Um, and then you send it to the committee members, please let me know by this date um, if, you, how you, if you have any feedback on this chapter. Um, it's in that note, right? So this could be the memo or some version of just, I'm sending this. Some people like to have a printout, right? So let me know if you'd like a physical copy of this, I'll drop one in your mailbox. Um, you can say, I hope you won't mind, I'll be sending a reminder three days before that date to remind you that I'm gonna be working on revisions on this chapter in this period. So part of that managing up is just like, I'll just be reminding you that this is coming, that I'm planning to work on this in this time. Let me know if you have any, you know, difficulties with that. And then, yeah, you would do a thorough comb through everything together um, once you, so often it's that you'll be like, you get the feedback from them and you're still, you're working on writing the next chapter. So you don't actually engage that feedback. It's always good to just read it and know what scale of response it's going to require. Um, but frequently you can be like just writing, getting feedback, writing, getting feedback, and then integrate it all, go through it all, um, and, and then have the supervisor read the full draft when they've signed off on it, send it to the committee. Um, and usually the supervisor won't necessarily do another pass, deep pass through. They might do a like typo level pass before it goes to the external. Some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is I'm so confident now that I'm going to have to work up against them again. Yeah. But disadvantages are really small. It takes a lot of time, but I think you're right. The advantage is that you know that there's not going to be any surprise from the committee. Yeah. 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 You know, and it's rare that there's something that happens at the end where you're like, this committee is not going to support me. They're going to block me going forward. Um, and so, one thing also to just look at is it, this is your dissertation and the committee is there to support you. And so it's good to know soon if there's someone who you actually, it's not helping you. Um, it's not uncommon to have a last minute switch in the last year that you have two people who have been on the committee for the whole time and then someone comes in. Um, and it's better to know that, and the way to know it is to make sure that you're sharing some work with them. But if you come up against someone who just disagrees with your reading of the literature or who is politically um, really different from you, it's, it's okay to not have them on the committee and not struggle with them, and especially not let them hold you up. Um, wow, uh, one of the online people had a partner whose committee mem member bailed a week before the defense. Yeah, so that's awful. And at that point, it's like, good to be talking to whoever the version of me is in your department. So talk to the grad coordinator, talk to your supervisor. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have just a few minutes to talk just really about the, um, the doing part. Um, so one of the things that I think is really true about writing is that we do much better when we plan for activity rather than outcome. So instead of setting um, goals, like I'm going to write my chapter, we set um, practices. I'm going to spend this amount of time every day, every workday, 
writing, or I'm going to um, write this many words every workday. So the difficult thing in the last year is that you have to be planning on outcome. So you have to know how many chapters has your supervisor signed off on? How many chapters has your committee member read? Um, so having all of that mapped out in blocks, I can show you my super dorky work timeline, which is basically like, I have things that are like, this is just a conference paper. This is a 40 minute conference paper. This is a first draft of something. This is submitted to a journal. This is rejected from a journal and I'm revising. This is, right, so you're trying to move things through a process. So the way to have um, an activity style with your writing but still hit outcomes is to make some of that very mechanical. So you get feedback and you just put it in the place where the feedback goes. And some of this, I think it benefits you to have it be material. So to have a folder where you've printed out the feedback from your supervisor. It's a different experience to read it that way. Um, the final dissertation space is a space to keep paper. Um, you, you will have, I'm sure all of you use Dropbox or Sync, so you're automatically backing up your work, um, but it's not bad to have physical backups um, and to be able to make your own notes. There's a haptic difference in working with this as an artifact. So I do think you need, even in this last year, to have a way that you think about activity. So there's lots of different metrics that you can use to do that. So words, um, number of words per week or per day of writing. Um, I use the metric of units of work. So um, times where you've turned off the internet and your phone is not on and you're just writing for uninterrupted blocks of 45 minutes. So a certain number of units. For me in my normal life and in the normal life of everyone I know, it is not possible to do more than three units of dedicated work for more than a week. So if you think that you're gonna write your dissertation for six hours a day or eight hours a day, I don't think you're actually gonna do that. Um, I think it's impossible to do and, and stay steady and um, happy and flourishing. So what I want you to do is just internally understand that this is a tiring process, the last push but you need a metric for what your activity is in finishing the dissertation that is not so tired I collapsed or um, so exhausted that I got really sick and that's why I took a break. You need a different metric, which is a, an activity metric. Does anyone have any other activity metrics that they use to um, standardize or routinize their writing other than words or time? A friend shared that she started um, working on the same chapter for a month and then mm -hmm. whatever that last day of the month sends it to her supervisor for feedback, even if it's some point form sections, just to say, nice. I'm done with this findings chapter, let's talk to me to talk about it, or even if it's just talking through the ideas at that point. And I thought that was a cool yeah. thing because instead of working for five months on the same chapter, just kind of yeah. off my hands and yeah. Yeah, so kind of like the, um, no, how do you pronounce it? November no novel oh, writing? Yeah. 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 So there's a November writing thing where you write a novel in the month of November and there's the academic versions of this too where you write an academic book in a month. Um, any other examples of things that are, I love that as a unit, a month, month unit. And then switch it up whether you want to or not. Right. Or, yeah. Yeah. Just make it mechanical almost. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I just, for the past couple of years, have been treating school as a job where I pretend that there's hours that I have to be yeah. there. Nice. Um, and I found that it's really useful because I realized I was spending a lot of energy on thinking about where I wanted to work yeah. and when I wanted to work. And if it's just that I get up in the morning and I like trick myself, go. Okay, I have to be here by 930. Yeah. And then I allow myself to leave at four and say like, I yeah. don't touch anything at night. Yeah. But it has been really useful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, you want to say something? Yeah, so I just started, uh, I created like what I call a daily writing routine. Um, and it involves like a, 
so I used, I found something and it talked a bit with like a sports metaphor. So like before you, like if somebody was like a baseball player, they don't just go out and play the game. They actually have a warm up, mm. and, and then they, then they play. And so I kind of went with that. So I actually have a warm up where I kind of review what the plan is and any reading that I'll have to do to kind of like that. I want to be writing a, when I, and then I go into a writing yeah. and then I have a, what I call like a second period and I do a little bit of um, okay like cleaning up I'll add in citations do some of that admin stuff and underline the key ideas that I was trying to write about and then try to answer like what am I really trying to say and then I have a third period where I do like revise and edits mm. and then uh, then I have a cool down period where I just kind of okay bullet point so what's what is what do I have to do next yeah. and then that becomes part of the warm-up for the next day that's and so, and then I just try to actually have now where I'm trying to build that as a habit. So that's why it's like my daily writing routine. And then I'm tracking and I'm trying to get to 66 days in a row doing that. So that then it's just like, cause that's what I've read is kind of, everyone says it takes 21 days to build a habit, but I've actually read where it's like 66 days for some people. So thinking if I can do it for 66 days, then this will actually become completely routinized. Nice. Yeah. And so that's really, um, that's a wonderful way to think about this um, sort of feature that um, Cecilia was talking about too, which is um, having, especially in this moment of the finishing, having the idea that you can just wait until you're inspired to work on writing is um, not going to work. Um, and there's lots of st more stuff I can say about this, but scheduling writing is going to work. Um, one way that people talk about this is recognizing that willpower is a thing we can build and get better at, but also we, it's kind of limited capacity, just like lifting weights, we get better the more we do it. Um, but the most you can take away any decision making option for your writing, the better. So one way that people do this is to have if then loops. So you set down and it's very dorky, but it does seem to work. So in Ryan's case, what he just illustrated is, if it's first period, I do this. If it's second period, I do this. If it's fourth period, I plan for tomorrow. If it's first period, I look at what I planned during fourth period yesterday and, or Alexa, if it's 9.30, I should be at work, right? If I'm at work, then I open the document. So having, you can actually like write them down. What are your if thens? So um, if, I'm writing, I have turned on cold turkey internet blocker. If I've turned on cold turkey internet blocker, I am writing. So these things that just let you um, loop in. Having an entry sequence or a kind of lift off. So this is, this is a moment to start having some rituals and some features of rituals. So this is a moment to have a special mug that is the mug that you drink out of when you're writing your dissertation. Um, it's a moment to have a hat that you put on when you're in an, a unit and your kid isn't allowed to interrupt you. And when they try to interrupt you, you just point at the hat and they're like, oh, I see that you're writing because you were wearing that hat. <laughs> and then you put on the hat. If I'm wearing the hat, I'm writing. So you can have lots of these things that enforce each other. This is the physical space. If I'm in this space, this is what I'm doing. For a lot of people, this is like, <laughs> Stacey says she needs a hat. For a lot of people, this is a moment where you can buy a computer that does not connect to the internet, that does not at all connect to the internet, and be like, if I'm at that computer, I am writing my dissertation. And if I need to bring anything from the internet, I bring it on this USB key like Tom Cruise um, <laughs> running. So you have some sense that you build whatever the things are that support you, and you be like unabashedly cheesy about that. So you have a thing that just cues your whole system that this is what you're doing now. Does that part make sense? Like this is the moment to be like, here's my, yeah. I lived in California for six years and I saw a lot of people have really terrible, like terribly embarrassing rituals. And, and it was only when I moved to rural Alaska to finish my dissertation that I was like, I too am going to have a terribly embarrassing ritual about this, but it's all these things. Okay, so scheduling, um, really good to assume that the worst is gonna happen and that you can still finish the dissertation. 
So this doesn't mean you have to um, hurt yourself. You should not hurt yourself finishing the dissertation. Also, if you decide not to finish the dissertation, that is okay. You don't have to do a dissertation. It's fine. <laughs> Nothing bad happens if you don't do a dissertation. So this is something that you can be like, why am I doing this? Um, it's a good credential. It's going to give me particular things. I'm building the capacity to write stuff very fast. I, if I go work for a non-academic situation, I am a person now who they can know that they can give a grant application to and I can get it done by tomorrow morning. Like there's many things that you are doing right now that no one can take away from you. Capacities that you're building, ways that you are powerful because you've done a, this much of this work. So it's that if you're gonna finish doing this, it should not really hurt you to do it. And you should be able to do it even if things are um, not totally perfect and ideal. So this is coming back to that quality of the good enough dissertation so that you can pass things in. I mean, the other thing that is great about Jana's friend being like, I just, I pass in the chapter at the end of the month is then you just you've written that many drafts of chapters. You just pass them in. So part of the thing that I think really helps with that is limiting the work. So that is not trying to work eight hours a day on academic work, whether that's your dissertation or your TA ship or your RA ship. It's having a fixed and firm end time to your day. So you're never working until you're just about to go to bed unless it's really an extraordinary circumstance. You know, sometimes all of us have a deadline that we have to meet, but it shouldn't be every day that you're staying up fretting about things and you're not actually functioning very well in those. Part of this is also about committing to taking breaks and play, having a sense that you deserve to enjoy your life and that you could die next week. So you don't wanna look at your life and say, um, it was a waste of my life that I spent that week working on my dissertation in that way. Um, I had a dissertation student die um, and it was really interesting because it was that he, in an accident suddenly, it had only been about six months that I felt like if he died, um, this wouldn't have been a waste of his life. Um, like he, he found a way to be with the dissertation that actually was a pleasure. And it really made me think about my own work and sort of why we do the things that we do in the way that we do them. So there is this narrative that you shouldn't be happy while you're writing a dissertation and especially while you're finishing a dissertation. And I do always think the death test is useful in that way. Like, is this the way you wanna spend your life if you were gonna die really soon? Um, and it's actually a reasonably good way to spend your life. It's you're doing an interesting thing that you probably kind of like. Um, but if you genuinely feel like this is terrible and you hate it and you hate yourself doing it, um, well, you probably need more breaks and then maybe you'll find that you like it again and you probably need to play more and then you might find a way to be with it. So the last thing in part four, um, yeah, so um, Christina notes like if you have a partner who comes home from work, even if you're working at home, you can be like work's over now, like now I'm done with work. Um, so a thing that I think helps with this is regarding deadlines as very firm. So just relating to deadlines as arbitrarily firm. So the end of the month, I'm sending in my chapter wherever it's at, but also this like, okay, if I want to defend in, I want to walk at the end of 2019 winter term, then I have to finish this by, you know, March. So you're always going to write something good. You can just be done. Yeah. And then the last part is managing up the administrivia. So um, ideally, you have a supervisor who will be very attentive to the different deadlines and the different things that need to happen. But this is the point to go to your grad administrative assistant, who in your department will be the person who actually understands what the real deadlines are and when everything needs to happen and write down fixed dates of when that needs to happen and then back them up a week in order to talk to your supervisor and committee about them. Or if you know that your supervisor is bad at even responding to your email, like doesn't respond for three weeks, be like, I need your response on this three weeks before the actual deadline so that 
they actually get you the response by the actual deadline that the university needs. Um, and that's just again in this mode of fight the like be actually giving your energy to work, doing good work on your dissertation, not fighting with the administration because something didn't happen in time. <laughs> it's irritating, I think, that you have to hold that role. Um, like ideally, you would have everyone would really understand what needed to happen and when. Um, and so I think it's just a, a sad fact that you, it's you're going to be the one who actually kind of has to know those things and take action based on them. Um, like most people, even if they're supervising someone, they're only supervising one, maybe they're supervising one PhD student a year who's graduating. Probably not even, but they won't remember what needs to happen or when, and they'll be sort of overbooked anyway. Um, yeah. Those are all the things that I wanted to say. Does anyone have any um, comments or questions or things to share? Yeah. What is life like after your, after your dissertation? So um, at the break, we were talking about how often what happens after you finish the dissertation is that you feel like really sad and flat um, and kind of let down. Um, and rarely do people actually feel like they experience the good, the goodness of really being done. I was saying that one of the weird things in my program is that there was no defense. So I never had the, um, I never had the experience of like people actually signed off on this, including people who weren't on my committee. One of the things that's good is we have defenses here. So one of the things that I encourage you to do is to let the people around you plan to celebrate you being done with your dissertation. Um, so ideally, you know, like ideally your supervisor, if you drink alcohol, will bring champagne to the defense. And if you're like, they're never going to do that, that's just not the way they are. Like tell a friend, it would be great if you would bring champagne to my defense. Like let people come and celebrate you immediately when it's over. And then do something that's like both an ephemeral thing that's not, um, you know, like I'm going to spend the day at Spa Nordique if you like that. Um, but also, I really recommend planning to be able to buy something that is durable and beautiful that you would not get otherwise, that is a marker of your, of your dissertation being done. So um, I like to buy art from friends, um, but people also get jewelry. Um, or uh, I know one person who got a really beautiful knife, kitchen knife, as their dissertation celebration. So you almost certainly will feel a gap and an emptiness um, being done with the dissertation. And this is a time where some of the people that I've seen, like the people who are involved with the public history blog, one of the things that can be, or in our department, we do an emerging scholars um, series. So when people are done with the dissertation, we have them come and give a talk about their dissertation work. And they write a blog post up about their work. So if you don't have those things in your department, it's good also to sort of think about like, okay, I'm going to be done with my dissertation. What might I want to like move into the next thing with it? So that could be you're going to be, um, you know, thinking about doing a postdoc or starting to apply for jobs or so that you start to really, I think it's just all part of the like, de-exceptionalizing the dissertation. So it's part of your everyday work, and then it's part of your everyday trajectory wherever you go, if you continue in academia or if you do something that there's a thread where it's all part of you. So it might be that you're like, I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna just try to explain to people why medieval political theory is totally relevant to you know, understanding Rihanna. Um, <laughs> You could set yourself like, now that I'm saying that, I'm like, yeah, I think that that actually, you could totally write a really interesting blog post about that. <laughs> and, yeah. It's weird though. It's a weird thing to finish this kind of, most people don't do, most people don't do this. Most people don't do an exercise of this scope in their life. It's cool. It's great that you're getting so close. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you for coming. I'll see you around. Thank you, all you onlineers. Feeling good.